in governments and bond track. So let's start by defining our problem in the rest. Okay. So as most of you may know, the knapsack problem is defined in the following way. We receive as an input a knapsack with a non-negative capacity C and a set of N objects with non-negative sizes SI and rewards VI. And the goal or the output that we or algorithm should compute is a set of a set J of objects that fit into the knapsack, that is the total size of these objects is at most the allowed capacity C and such that the total reward is maximized. So this is a classical NPR problem. Let's add some randomization to this problem. So now the stochastic setup we are going to consider is the following. Now, we will not central this talk that the capacity of the knapsack is equal to one for simplicity. Now, our input is a set of n objects with deterministic rewards, vi, and a probability distribution on the sizes si of the items. The output should be a set j of objects that fit into the knapsack, such that the expected total reward is maximum. So we, we want to come up with an algorithm that maximizes the expected value of the um, total reward that we obtain from these items. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh, it, it says that the rewards are, are deterministic. Yes, there are, there are some, some fixed numbers yeah, that are given to us. Okay, so this expectation is not of random variables, right? Oh, well, but you have to keep in mind that the set J um, is a random variable. Oh, okay, yeah, see. Okay, thanks. So how do you know that like summation has side less than one? Like, is that a high probability thing? Oh yeah, so that will be completed with the setup we are going to consider. Okay. So just let me explain. Okay, so first of all, we are going to assume that the size SSI are independent random variables. We're going to assume that the items are added sequentially into the knapsack. We add them one by one. Once we try to put an item into the knapsack, its size is instantiated, right? So its size is drawn from the respective probability distribution and it gets instantiated. The process will stop once an item overflows the capacity of the knapsack. In that case, the, that the, the overflowing item would not contribute anything to our value. So here is a simple example. Suppose that we have um, a set of n items, the value of each item is one, the probability that SI is half is equal to half, for all the items, and the probability that SI is one fourth is equal to half. So maybe we we start number three. Now it's, it gets instantiated to half. I number one, the size gets instantiated to one fourth, and then when I do size gets instantiated to half. Now we, we surpass or allow or allow capacity and hence the value of the solution we get is is the set of here. Like you cannot even choose if you're gonna pick an object or not. They just come randomly. No, you you are allowed okay. Um I'm going to explain what kind of policies are we going to consider, but throughout this talk, we are going to assume that we we are allowed to let's say to, to pick a sequence of items that we're going to input into or not. I, I think the, the question is about like what information do you have? So maybe uh, like 
do you know all the distributions and all the items beforehand? Yes, yes we do. We do know all the distributions before. So our input, we, we know all the rewards and we know the probability distribution that is, that is known to us. So based on that information, we, we come up with a policy with, a, with an algorithm and start deciding which items to insert into the NAPSEC. Wait, so I guess just to be clear, right? So, so when we're deciding whether or not to add an item, we, we don't actually know what it's decided. Yeah, we don't know. We what just know what the distribution, but we yes. do know what its value is. We know what it's value. So we're just making decisions based off of values and what we've already put into the map side, essentially. Well, there are yeah. two kind of policies that okay. we are going to consider. I will perhaps I should explain that now. So one of them is a non-adaptive policy. In a non-adaptive policy, we compute a sequence of items, I1 up until IN, of items that are going to be inserted in that particular order. And this, this algorithm will not make any further decision once the process starts. So we, we determine the sequence beforehand. And once we start adding items into the knapsack, we, we are not allowed to modify our sequence. Another natural setup is an adaptive policy in the sense that we are allowed to make dynamic decisions in reaction to the instantiated sizes of the items inserted in the knapsack thus far. So we start adding items into the knapsack one by one. And depending on the available set of items and the available capacity, we choose our next object. So here's an example. Suppose that we have three items. Each of them has a value of one. And suppose that the size distribution for the items is given in this way. It's, it's not hard to show that the optimum, optimal non-adaptive policy is given by the sequence one, two, three. In that case, the expected value of our solution is going to be 1.5. So we are always going to be allowed to insert the first item because it says it's going to be either 0 0.2 or 0 0.6. We'll never be allowed to insert the third item, right? So all the, the two possible combinations, 0 0.2 plus 0 0.8 and 0 0.6 plus 0 0.8 already surpassed the allowed capacity of one. But now with probability half, we get to insert the second item. And that happens when the size of item one gets instantiated to 0 0.2. And with probability half, we are not going to be allowed to insert the second item. So with probability half, our value is one. And with probability half, our value is two. So the expected value is 1.5. Now, the, oh, the optimal adaptive policy looks like this. We insert item one, depending on the outcome, we either decide to insert item two or item three. So um, note in this, in this case that we, we have a certain advantage by, by this adaptive policy because if we insert item one and its size gets instantiated to 0 0.6, then we will never be able to insert item two. But maybe we had a chance with item three if its size gets instantiated to 0 0.4. So that's an advantage for us. Now, if we compute the expected value of this solution, um, I'm not going to do that, but we will obtain a value, an expected value of 1.75. Now, this, there's a recurring theme with these adaptive policies. And um, Adaptive policies can always be viewed as a decision tree. So just as non-adaptive policies can be viewed as a, as a sequence, adaptive policies can be viewed as a decision tree. So we start by inserting one particular item, depending on what's best to us. And then based on the outcome of its instantiated size, we, we get to decide which item to insert next, right? So for instance, a sequence can also be viewed as a as a decision tree, but in that case, um, in in the let's say in the level k of the decision tree, the item will be the same. So there's no much sense in viewing non-adaptive policies as decision trees. One issue with adaptive policies is that they can be very complicated objects. Just... 
uh, are you assuming like that the sizes have like discrete support? Because when you say like decision tree, like it looks to me that you are. Yeah, for, for, for this talk, we will just. Okay. Nice question. Um, yeah, they can be very complicated objects. So like they will have an exponential number of leaps. Now, one question that arises is how, how can we, even an algorithm for the stochastic knapsack, how can we measure uh, how effective the algorithm is? So this following definition will be quite useful. That's the adaptivity gap. So the adaptivity gap or the stochastic knapsack is defined uh, as the supremum over all instances i for this problem of adapt i by non-adapt i, where adapt i is the maximum expected value that we can hope to achieve with an adaptive policy, and non-adapt i is the maximum expected value that we can hope to achieve with a non-adaptive policy. So in, the, in this particular case, we know we know already by the example that, that I, I showed before that um, the adaptivity gap is at least um, seven by six. So this quantity by this quantity. Now for an algorithm A for the stochastic knapsack, we say that its performance guarantee is given by this quantity. So the supremum over all instances i for the stochastic knapsack of adapt i by the expected value um, of the items that are older than computes. Now, it makes sense to compare the performance of all algorithm with adapt i, because in a sense, given the information that we have, an adaptive policy, and given the setup that we have, an adaptive policy is the best that we can do. There like a an arbitrarily large decision tree. For instance, it would not make sense to compare the performance guarantee of our algorithm um, with, let's say, with, with, the, with the value of an optimal solution that can see the future. So like, like, a, like a, a solution that can see the outcome of the random variables, right? So let, let's say that we have that our knapsack has capacity one, and let's say that the sizes of the items are going to be equal to one with, capacity, with probability half or equal to zero with probability half. Um, if we, in a sense, we can, if we can see the future, then like we know that in average, half of those sizes, like we know that half, like around half of the, of, of the sizes are going to be instantiated to zero. So we will be able to insert half of the items more or less, right? But um, given the information that we have, like, and, and the setup that we have of starting inserting the items in the knapsack, and once the item is in the knapsack, its size gets instantiated. Um, we like the expected value of such an algorithm is at most a constant. So it doesn't make sense to compare the performance of of our algorithm, um, let's say with an arbitrarily good algorithm that can see the outcome of the random variables, but it does make sense to compare it um, with the best possible adaptive policy. Now, an issue that arises here is that an optimal adaptive policy can be a very complicated object, right? Um, so um, we are going to see that there is a way to find an upper bound for this quantity, adapt of i. So there, there's a way to, to define an LP formulation for the problem and find a nice upper bound for that. And hence, um, the performance of, of, of our algorithm will be much easier to handle. Yes. In this setting, could there be like uh, dynamic programming type approach to actually compute with that time? Yeah, so so actually, I'm not going to talk that 
I'll talk about that today because we don't have time, but um, the authors in this paper derive a, a three plus epsilon approximation. Um, if you assume epsilon is a constant that runs in polynomial time and is this a dynam dynamic programming approach. So you consider like you assume that your decision tree um, has a number of has k levels, let's say, where k depends on epsilon. No, I and, guess I mean directly computing at that time very Like given certain assumptions in the probability distribution, yes. But Okay, so the main result of this paper is that the adaptivity gap is, is a constant. Like, so the author, in particular, the authors give a polynomial time on adaptive algorithm with a constant performance guarantee, which is quite surprising. So, okay, so back to our question, given an instance I of the stochastic knapsack, how to find a good upper bound for adaptive factor? Before answering that question, I'm going to give some useful definitions. So for item I, we're going to define its mean truncated size as the expected value of this quantity, the minimum between SI and one. Note that it, it, may, it does make sense to consider such a random variable, minimum of SI and one, because um, if SI can be larger than one, like, Maybe, maybe SI is equal to two with probability half, or maybe SI is equal to 100 with probability half, but for us, it's all the same. We are not going to be able to insert that item anyways into the knapsack. So it does make sense to define such a quantity. And in fact, um, this quantity is going to, be, to make our life much easier when analyzing algorithms. Now the effective value of item I is, Define as wi equal to vi times the probability that si is at most one. So that's um, that's an upper bound on the expected value. That's an upper bound on the expected value that can, we, are, we can obtain from item i. The LP relaxation that we are going to consider is the following is theta of t equal to the maximum of the summation over the item psi of wi xi subject to the constraint um, that the summation over the item psi of mu i times xi is at most t. And xi is a, is a quantity between three and one. So note that, the, for instance, if we are in the deterministic setup, it does make sense to consider this quantity wi instead of bi, because maybe we are in the deterministic setup and we have a, an object with an arbitrarily large size. So, I mean, we, we are never, never going to be able to insert it into the knapsack, uh, but for this LP, maybe we can insert a, a fraction of that item. And if its value is very large, then that will make the, the value of the LP blow up, right? And the key theorem that we are going to show first is that adapt, of i, I'm just omitting the, the i, is at most theta of t. So before showing that, we will need some useful lemmas. So I'm putting this here, so just so that you remember the notation. Sorry, can you get the mind? So, value of s is equal 
to the value of the items in S, size of S is equal to the total size of the items in S, and same with mu of S. Now, one nice lemma, and this lemma is an additional motivation to consider the random variable mu i, sorry, the, the variable mu i, is that, that the probability that the size of S is less than one is at most one minus mu of S. This is quite easy to show is that you, is you prove it in the same way as you prove Markov's inequality. So we know that the probability that the size of S is at most one is equal to this probability. There should be a, the bracket should be here. By Markov's inequality, that probability is at most the expected value. Now, the minimum between the size of S and one is at most the summation, right? So that expected value is at most this expected value, which is um, mu of S by linearity of expectation. Now, one important remark is that it, if we let A denote the successfully inserted items by some fixed adaptive policy, then the expected value of mu of A can be larger than one. In, the, in, the, in a deterministic setup, that will never happen, but it can happen in this stochastic setup. So you can consider the following example. You can consider that we have an infinite set of items where VI is equal to one and S of I is a Bernoulli random variable with probability P, then this is sort of similar to, to a negative binomial. So the, the expected value of the size of A is easy to show that that's equal to two by P minus one. And we know that mu of I is equal to P for all I, and hence uh, the expected value of mu of A is this quantity times this quantity, that is two minus P. So if P is very small, that expected value can be um, arbitrarily close to two. One nice theorem is that the expected value of mu of A is at most two. And in, so for this particular lemma, we, we are allowed to include the overflowing item in A. So like in this remark, A denoted the successful inserted items. And in this lemma, we, uh, A denotes the set of items that the policy attempts to insert. So that includes the overflowing item. I'm not going to prove it because we don't have time, but the proof is not hard. One needs to use martingales. Okay. So now let's prove that ADA is at most T top two. So again, let A denote the set of items that an adaptive policy tries to insert. And let's define a vector X given by X of I equal to the probability that I is in A. By linearity of expectation, we have that the expected value of mu of A is exactly this sum, right? And we just showed that the expected value of mu of A is at most two. So hence uh, X, this, this vector is, is feasible in here. Okay. Now let, let's try to, to find a, a bound for the expected reward of, of the solution given by uh, a fixed adaptive policy. So let fit IC be the independent, the, Indicator, this is indicator, no independent. The indicator random variable that indicates whether SI is at most C. So, I mean, this variable is equal to one if this event happens and it's zero otherwise. And let CI be the capacity remaining when the policy P attempts to insert I. It's important to know that that random variable CI is well defined as long as I is in A. So, okay. Um, we have that the expected profit for item I 
is equal to vi times the probability that we insert the item. The probability that we insert the item um, is precisely, well, first of all, the, the probability that i belongs into the set of items that we attempt to insert. And like this event needs to occur. And also the event that fit i of ci is equal to one, that also needs to occur. So like when we attempt to insert item i, um, its size must be at most the available capacity CI. All right. Now, this quantity is equal to this. We're just using the definition of conditional probabilities. And now this probability here um, is going to be at most the probability that fit I comma one is equal to one, right? Because one is, is, is uh, greater equal than CI. Okay. Now, if we look at this, at these two events, fit I of one equal to one and I belonging into A, I mean, you notice that this, this event is independent of this, all right? And therefore, um, this probability here is equal to the probability that fit I of one is equal to one which is equal to the probability that SI is at most one. And hence we have this inequality. And that inequality is precisely uh, WI XI by your definition of WI and XI. So um, the expected profit of, for item I is, is at most WI XI. And therefore, um, the expected value of our solution, which is equal to the sum over the itemized over the expected value of, pro of the profit for itemized by linearity of expectation, that will be at most the sum over the i's of wi xi, which is uh, at most t of two. Okay. Now let's let's take a look at this LP. Um, this, this LP is relatively simple. It's the intersection of the unit hypercube with a half space. There's only one constraint not involving the hypercube. So in that case, um, we order the items by decreasing value density in the sense that W1 by mu of one is at least W2 by mu of two and so on. Well, in here, uh, I'm assuming that the mu of i's um, are larger than zero. The Sorry, David, I, uh, David, can you can you just show the previous slide? Yeah, so can you explain like why you sort of, you could remove the conditioning there in the, in the last step? So you have probability fit i comma one equal to one given that i is in a, and it seems like you're saying that that's, I mean, you're removing the conditioning there and saying that that's just the probability that fit i comma one is equal to one. So can you explain why you can do that? Well, so we define fit i of c as the indicator random variable for the event that is i is at most c. So fit um, like in this conditional probability, the CI depends on the event that I belong to. Yeah, the, like it depends on this event. But in this case, uh, it does not matter if, if I belongs into A or not, because we are assuming that the, the sizes of the items are independent random variables. So um, like the probability that this is equal to one is, is simply, um, the probability that like, like that if we take the probability distribution for the size of item i, that's simply the probability that uh, that si is going to be at most one. That that does not depend on our on our adaptive policy. That that's given by the implicit uh, probability distribution of the size of item. 
so it it seems like here you're using uh, some properties as a setup that that the algorithm the policy decides to insert item i without knowing its realization right so that's why i in a is uh, it has is not having any effect on the on the realization of si yeah. i mean that's that that's that's crucial here right um is is it okay i can i'm just i'm just clarifying that it seems crucial here that like the like i being in a like you're deciding on item i without knowing its realization because yes, otherwise right, right. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Um, okay. So as I was saying, like if one of the mu i's is equal to zero, that means uh, that the expected value of its size is zero. And since we are assuming that the values of the um, of the items are non negative then we will always be able to insert that item into the knapsack without incurring any budget cost on our capacity. Um, so if, if one of the mu, mu i's is equal to zero, we simply insert the item immediately into the knapsack and like, uh, yeah, then we, we can simply remove the variables associated with that um, item. And like the new, like this new optimal will differ by a constant with the original LP. So we can assume that now. Um, and yeah, so an optimal solution packs items in that order, taking a suitable fraction of the overflowing item. Like th this is not hard to show, perhaps I leave it as an exercise. Now, more formally, if we let mk be equal to the sum of the item side from one to k of mu i and if we let t um, be a, a number in this close interval in the close interval between mk minus one and mk where this eta will be implicitly defined here then theta of t will be equal to this value. So we insert all the first k minus one items completely, and we insert the, the fraction implied there for the overflowing item. So one question that arises is, okay, what if, what if we tried a greedy approach? What if we just, uh, compute that, that greedy ordering and start trying to attempt to insert the items in, in that particular order, will that be any good? That will not be good, not even in the de deterministic case. So for example, um, suppose that the size of one is some epsilon, the value of one is two epsilon, and, oh, there should be a one here, I'm sorry. And both the size of two and the value of two is equal to one. If we follow the greedy order, we will obtain a value of two epsilon, which will come like will be given by inserting item one. The, if we insert item, item one, we are not going to be able to insert item item two since its size is equal to one. Right, but we know that the optimum um, the optimal value for this problem is one. So the greedy approach can be arbitrarily bad, even in the deterministic case. However, there's a way to modify that Greek approach slightly in a way that will give us a two approximation. So again, consider the greedy ordering and let S be the set computed by the greedy algorithm and let I be the overflowing item. Then it's not hard to show that the optimal value 
for the problem divided by two will be at most the maximum of these two quantities. So in a similar spirit, we will define um, a Gnidi algorithm for the stochastic knapsack. So first of all, we will assume we have lost the generality that theta of one is equal to one. This we can assume because like if that was not the case, we can simply scale the, the values of the items. Now let R be the minimum index such that the sum of the new of is, is at least one. And we will assume for simplicity in this talk that the sum of the new i's from one to r is exactly one. So in particular, the, the above condition implies that the sum of the w i's from one to r is equal to one. So those two assumptions will be quite useful for analyzing the stochastic greedy algorithm, which is the following. We choose item k, um, where k goes between one and r, with probability w of k and insert it. And after we insert it, well, if we insert it successfully, um, we, we attempt to insert the items, the remaining items in the greedy order. I'm not going to, to, um, to give a full analysis of that algorithm, but I'm just going to get you started. Um, so well, first of all, the authors of the paper show that the, this algorithm achieves an expected value of at least seven by 32 times ADAPT, which remember ADAPT is the maximum expected value that we can hope to achieve with an adaptive policy. So, okay, I'm putting the randomized video here for you to remember. So let's get started. Let's let f of k denote the event that uh, item k fits into the knapsack. Let a1k denote the event that k is chosen first. And let a minus k denote the event that uh, an item whose index is less than k is chosen first. Now, the expected profit that we can obtain from item that we obtain from item k is, again will be equal to the value of k times the probability that item k gets inserted into the knapsack. By the law of total probability, that uh, the probability of event fk, the probability that k fits into the knapsack, is equal to this value here. Given the results that we have seen already, we should be able to either compute those quantities exactly or find a suitable bound. So more precisely, um, well, by the definition of the randomized query, the probability of the event A1K is equal to WK, which was item K first with probability WK. The probability that we choose that the first item that we choose is an item whose index is lower than k is equal to the sum of the wi's from one to k minus one. Um, the probability of fk given a1k, that is the probability that um, element k fits, given that k shows in first, well, that's going to be by how we define the algorithm equal to um, bk um, yeah so let's see. yeah just assume that there is a bk here <laughs> just assume that there is a bk here and then this quantity will go by our definition of WK, sorry about that. All right. Um, the probability that K fits, given that we choose an item whose index is lower than K, well, that's equal 
to the probability that the sum of the sizes of the first k items is at most one, right? And by the first lemma that I show you, that's at most this quantity, one minus mu of the first k, k items. And in a similar way, we, we find an problem for this. So, okay, let's recall our assumptions here. So, if we um, put all those terms in the previous equation and replace some of the big case with its lower with its um, lower bound WK, then we get that the expected profit of K is at least this, this thing here. Now, as I, as I told you, I, I was just going to get you started. So I'm not going to prove what follows, but um, well, I mean, this follows by linearity of expectation. But now using only the above three assumptions, one can obtain the following bound for this, for this solution. The proof, the proof is kind of tedious, but like it's nice in the sense that it is basically just algebra. And now, using the concavity of theta of t, one can prove this inequality, one plus omega at most theta of two. Um, so maybe I should play this here. Remember if, if you have a, a concave function, then one can show that it's differentiable. Then f of j is at most f of x. Times y minus x. So in that case, just replace y with two, x with one, x with one, would be one, would be theta of two. And this derivative. Um, Can obtain that from from this mm. equation. Okay, right now, therefore, um, randomized greedy, which is the expected value of our algorithm by adapt, is at most this quantity. Now, if we minimize. Um, if we, we, if we minimize this fraction over the feasible region of omega, then we get that this is at most seven by 32. And that completes the proof of this theorem. Are there any questions? Okay, so now let's, let's give an improved non-adaptive algorithm. So we're going to, the A is going to denote the set of items that a given adaptive policy attempts to insert. Recall that the expected value of mu of A was at most two, and that was the crucial fact in giving an upper bound for adapt. Now, um, in order to give an improved bound for adapt, we will need to consider the following lemma. So for any set of items J, the expected value of mu of A intersect J is at most that quantity. I'm not going to prove that due to time constraints, but when it's not hard to show by induction on the size of J and some probabilistic arguments that that holds. Now, um, using that lemma, 
we can prove theorem three. We can prove that um, adapt is at most C of two, where C of t is the value of this of t. So again, we have the same objective function as before. But now we have a, a capacity constraint for every set of items. And again, we assume that uh, the vector x is in the unit hypercube. So it's stronger than the. Yes. This is better than that. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So why does that follow? Again, let xi denote the, the probability that we attempt to insert item i. Right, so a was the set of items that an adaptive policy attempts to insert. Then um, we have that the summation over the item j, which is equal to this quantity by linear expectation, is at most two times that quantity, and this follows from this. Level. So we have a, a feasible vector x. X is feasible for this OP. And the rest of the proof follows exactly as the proof of the other theorem. Now, notice that we have an exponential number of constraints. So one question that arises is, OK, we know that adapt is at most C of 2, but uh, can we actually compute that value? The answer is yes. Um, I'm not going to, be, to give you a closed form for C of two, but I'm going to give you a closed form for C of one. Um, so by the concavity of C of T, we can show that C of two is at most two times C of one. And from the previous theorem, it follows that adapt is at most two times C of one. Now we have this nice lemma. You have the C of one is equal to this term here, where we are considering uh, the greedy ordering for the items. Again, the proof is quite nice, so I'm going to show that. Um, let set of phi be equal to mu of phi times xi, then by replacing. Uh, set of phi with x of phi in here, we get that c of one is equal to the value of this of t, right? Now, um, notice that the feasible region of this of t is equal to the feasible region of this of t. So this, this 12 piece um, only differ in the, in the fact that we have a constraint here for set of phi. We, we have the constraint that set of phi should be at most mu of phi. But that constraint is implicit when we consider the set j equal to singleton i. Right? So if j is equal to singleton i, then uh, this quantity here is mu of phi. So the constraint set of phi at most mu of phi is, is already implicit, so we can remove it. OK. Um, If we define this function for any set of items, j, f of j equal to one minus this product, which is this thing here, it's, it's easy to show that that's a submodular function. And therefore, the feasible region is a poly matrix. I guess most of you should remember from Ricardo's class what that is, but I'm just going to define it again. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, let's pause. And let F. 
Yes, yeah, mother or commission. And let the yeah, and dimensional vector. Then a polymatrix is a feasible region of the following form. Polymatrix by definition. Um, if the Porter more, if we assume that F is also monotone in the sense that F of X is at most F of Y um, for every X in Y. We assume that it is monotone. And if we assume that f of the empty set is zero, as and if we assume that f of, of the empty set is equal to zero, which is the case with the function that I gave there, and then we can find. Uh, we can compute a greedy solution for this of B for the following P. Um, max C transpose X, given that X is in the physical region. And uh, so we computed in the following way. So we first order the items according to their C value. Now, our solution, our optimal solution for this of B will be given by the following quantity. Um, X of Y will be equal to W of F. First, A items. Minus the value of F, the first I minus one items. Um, or I between one and K. And I mean, we, we, we define this bracket zero as the end And yeah, and, and X I uh, equal to zero. So one can remember that one can show via complementary slackness argument that this indeed is a, an optimal solution. We can compute the optimal value of that would be. This is crude code, right? It's, yeah, it's the same speech. <laughs> you need to share the screen again. Um, oh, there are questions. No, I <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. Um, so 
the feasible region is a polymetric. F is monotone. F of the empty set is zero. And then we can apply that result that Ricardo showed us. This zero five yields an optimal solution. And then we we just need to rearrange these terms to obtain this quantity. Now consider a simplified grid algorithm. If there is an item i, so the wi is at most c of one by two, then we insert only that item. We're being very simplistic here, of course, like if we we did not exceed capacity, we can insert more items. But for the sake of analysis, analyzing this algorithm, we will assume that we insert only item. And well, if this fails, if this condition fails, then we insert all items in the greedy order. I'm going to skip a crucial step in that proof, but otherwise everything should be there. So what we are going to show here, I should have mentioned that, is that the expected value of the solution computed by the simplified greedy algorithm um, is at most C of one by two. So if the first condition is met, uh, it, uh, then the result follows. But now let's assume that the first condition is not met. So suppose that the first condition fails, define PI as the probability um, that the sum of the sizes SK between one and i is less than one. So that's that's equal to the probability that the first k item k first k items um, fit given this greedy insertion. Um, the crucial quantity that we need to bound is this summation over here. Um, so this summation. It's equal to this and just multiply by mu i by mu i. We can rearrange those terms to obtain this inequality. So far, no, no, nothing fancy has been done. And then one can show that for every k, this bound follows. So one can show that uh, the summation, this summation over here, is at most this quantity. This is a, a very non trivial bound, and I'm not going to prove that today. Let's know that it falls. And now, well, we have this quantity, and we can rearrange the terms again. And we obtain this. And that was precisely C of 1 by our last theorem. So we have a bound for this sum. This sum is at most, is at least C of 1. So now um, we have that the expected profit of our solution, which is equal to the sum of i of, of the terms pi times vi. And since vi is greater or equal than wi, then this sum gives us a lower bound for the expected value of our solution. And now this sum, well, we're just splitting the sums here. This is equal to uh, this sum minus this sum. And by this, by the previous equation, this sum is at least C of one. We assume that the first condition fails. So each WI is, is less than C1 by two, and hence we, we have this inequality. And now this is just a telescopic sum of probabilities. So uh, this sum is less than one. And if you obtain that bound, the expected profit of our algorithm is at least C of one by two. So notice that. Uh, in the analysis of both algorithms, it was crucial to find a suitable upper bound for the maximum expected value over the adaptive policies. So this is what we just proved. The simplified greedy algorithm 
obtains an expected value of at least 0 0.1 by 2, which by the previous result is at least uh, a dot by 4. So we, we obtain a power approximation for this. And so that's all the results I, that I was going to show you, but here are some additional results that either I, that either I didn't mention or, or are in another paper. So uh, for instance, the same authors of this paper, they give, as I mentioned to Ricardo, they give a polytime adaptive policy that yields a three plus epsilon approximation for any constant epsilon via dynamic programming approach. The best current approximation for a polytime adaptive policy is given by Vaiga. He gave uh, two plus epsilon approximation for any constant epsilon. There are, there are also some other setups that I didn't mention. And these authors consider Gupta, Krishna, Swami, Molinaro, and Ravi. They give constant factor approximations for the stochastic not so problem in a setup where rewards are allowed to be correlated. And jobs, like if we view the item, jobs that are meant to be scheduled in, in, in a machine, one by one, uh, are allowed to be canceled after we schedule them. So maybe we, we inserted, like we have this, this machine and we inserted a job. And maybe we just get to know its size once the job finishes its processing time. So maybe if the job is taking too long, maybe we will want to attempt to insert other jobs instead of this one. So maybe we can cancel that job. I mean, we may lose some time there, but maybe it's for the best. Maybe it's better that we cancel it. So these authors consider those kind of setups and they give constant factor approximations for that. So maybe if one of you is unsure of what to present, you could present that paper. Uh, an important thing that I didn't mention is that, um, so in the setup that we consider, um, we were assuming that the rewards were deterministic. In the Uh, that I over non that I uh, like that got me thinking like sometimes people talk about like regress and then you compare like with time like, do they mention something like that in the paper like that how, how close to that because what I, what I understood from what it said perhaps if you just repeat uh, or correct me was that like you're just saying me what you're I telling me that you think it's unfair to look at all the possible trajectories and think of the best possible outcome because that would imply that you knew what the, the random thing would do. Yeah, so like like we we want to compare our algorithm with the best possible algorithm that has the exact same information as we do, right? So an adaptive like an arbitrary adaptive policy has the same initial information as we do. Like so as I was saying, it, it will not make much sense to compare the performance of our algorithm. Uh, let's say with, with the optimal value of the NACSAC problem, given uh, that the all sizes have been instantiated, right? So maybe if, if uh, all the sizes have been instantiated, then we can look at them and we, ca we can compute a very good value for this problem, but um, it, it wouldn't make sense to, to compare all looking with such a thing because of uh, what I mentioned. So for instance, you can, you can consider the following example. Um, you probably do it this
Do you swipe when you take the Yeah, because my down, my down is actually. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've seen the BI is equal to one for a line. I've seen that it's a uh, the Bernoulli random variable with probability half. So it's, it's equal to one with probability half, it's equal to zero with probability half. And So like if we have a, a set of items and a set of items and then we, we expect that around half of the items get sizes instantiated to zero, right? So like in hindsight, the best outcome would be to insert those items, right? Like we'll be inserting half of the items. But on the other hand, if we are not allowed uh, to check the instantiated size, the instantiated sizes of the items before trying to insert them into the knapsack, before committing to inserting inserting them into the knapsack. Um, then the like all policies would duplex the same, right? Because like all, the, all these random variables are the same. So uh, the, the only policy that you have is to start right, inserting the items in an arbitrary order, and the expected out, outcome of that will be all the Regardless of the order, right? So, and in that particular case, the, the expected value of that solution will be at most a constant. So, if we compare, if we compare that con, it will be unfair to compare that constant to n by half, right? So, the, so it, it, what makes sense is to compare the performance of our algorithm with the best possible algorithm that has the same information that we do. I have a question. You you had some the proof of like phi one. You said that it's a polymetroid, and so we have this exact solution. What happens for phi two? Like, is it not a polymetroid? So that's also a polymetroid. If if so, okay. Via this argument, for instance, the function f. Maybe I can show this. Actually, I can. Share you. Yes, let's go. Okay. Um, so yeah, remember remember that f of j, the f of j that I defined mm -hmm. was was that thing there, mm -hmm. right? It's it's easy to show that that is modular. Now and um, well. If that is submodular, then t times that function is also submodular for some non negative t. Yeah. Um, using the same argument that I gave you in the talk, uh, we, can, we can find uh, like the same suitable expression for c of t as long as t is at most one. Because, the, like, let's say, like the, one of the key steps was, was to remove. The upper bound in set of i, right? So remember that okay. uh, we had a, a, an upper bound on set on set i, so, and we can remove that that constraint if t is at most one, because if t is at most one, uh, that constraint will be implicit here by replacing j with singleton i. If T is larger than one, and you also get a polymetric. I didn't. But I guess you have those constraints. Yeah, you just need a better way to handle them. Yeah, perhaps it was confusing to, to show you this paper, but yeah. Um, okay. Regina will be is an intersection of a polymetric will be with a box. So a box is. Uh, a feasible region of constraints of, of the form xi less than less than some quantity at most. Okay. Yes. 
Uh, so you mentioned that the like the there's an upper bound of two plus epsilon on this adaptive decap, right? Yes. So is there any lower bound known? Like, is it always at least? Two? That's a that's a good question. I, I tried to look a bit into that yesterday. Um, uh, sorry, uh, like is two plus epsilon the bound of the adaptivity gap or the approximation? Approximation. Two plus epsilon is, is the approximation that they give for a uh, poly time adaptive policy. Yes, so it's not it's not necessarily an upper bound on the adaptivity gap, right? Is there a better adaptivity gap known than what these guys prove of four? Yeah, yeah. The, the, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I should have looked into that in more detail. But... I mean, so the example that you have in your presentation already shows a lower bound of yeah. seven sixth, I guess. So, yeah, uh, yeah I, I think one, one paper by the same errors just give a simple example with an adaptive pick up of five by four, if I remember correctly. But uh, yeah, I'm sure there must be a much better bound, but I just am I'm not aware of it. And is if I looked at just finding the best non-adaptive policy, is there a is there like a one plus epsilon known for that? Like, what's the best? No, so like it is. Oh yeah, good point. I should have mentioned that. Uh, it is an open problem whether there is a beta's for for these problems. So like, it is an open problem whether there is a one plus epsilon approximation for some constant epsilon. Like, but that's I wasn't quite asking that. I'm just asking if I wanted to approximate the non-adaptive optimum. Oh, I see what you mean now. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I have a question uh, regarding your last slide, I think. I'm not sure if this is what you mentioned, but I was just thinking, what if you decide a sequence and the policy is like for each item, you, you've considered the sequence in this order and then for each item, you decide if you put the item into the NAMP tech or not based on, on the remaining capacity. Like, Can you repeat that question? Yeah, so if, if for each item you put the item in the NAMP tech and then its size gets realized is something, right? So maybe yes. uh, before committing to putting the item, maybe for each item, you can decide if you will put the S item in the NAMP tech or not based on the remaining capacity. That's that's a, a good question. Point. Uh, I think this setup has not been considered uh, to my knowledge. Like, yeah, so like, so if I understood correctly, Okay, so that's not setup. what you say here by the dynamic programming approach, right? So what I'm saying is not the same as this dynamic. So approach. if I understood correctly, the setup that you are suggesting is one in which uh, we, okay, so we insert the items one by one into the knapsack and one like before, like we choose an item and before ins inserting that into the knapsack, we instantiate its size and then we get to decide whether to insert it or not. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, I think, I think this has not been considered. Okay. Well, when okay. I do the same as, you know, normal, like if you know before, before inserting, you know, that it's still normal, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, but like, like now to be, I guess that, yeah, I think like a setup will be like, you, you need to discard that object maybe for Oh, you just throw it away. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But but something similar was considered in, in this paper, right? Like not like you can decide whether to insert it or not based on the things that I've realized so far. That's what they call ordered adaptive or something. Um, I, I haven't looked too much in, in that chapter. Um, but just the definition, like what 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 does uh, ordered adaptive mean? Like they had something in like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in the order adaptive model, we must process the items in some given ordering 
and for each item um, in the sequence, we must adaptably decide whether to insert it into the knapsack or discard it forever. Um, but yeah, so this differs a bit in the setup that Mateo suggested because in here, there's also like already a fixed ordering. I, I think I think the only diff I mean that's that I, I thought that was also true in Matthias' question, but I think the difference is just whether you decide to insert it or not based on the already realized items or also based on whether this items also based on this item's realization. Um, yeah, I I think. By, by what you just read, it's like this was exactly what I was thinking about. So yeah, yeah, that's what that's what it looked like from his question. Yeah, I I, I haven't read like to be honest this this chapter much, so I'm not so sure. Okay. Uh, Thank you anyway, yeah. I, I can answer you that question that I was later. All right, yeah, the, the, no, that's not a problem. Yeah, take your time. Are there any more questions? Okay, then it's time to see them. <laughs> Yeah, also I forgot to say something in the beginning. Uh, we are going to take a break for the in between terms, so that we are going to get back on September second. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you very much, and thank you, David. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. See you next time.